Can you hear me? All right, great. Welcome back to the afternoon session of the August 3rd Landmarks Preservation Commission's public hearing. We are going to resume the afternoon session with item number six on our public hearing agenda. And I'll turn it over to Corey Halala to read it into the item, into the uh, record. <laughs> Excuse me. Okay, so we'll start back up again with item six. This is LPC 21 10606, an application for a certificate of appropriateness in the borough of Manhattan, block 233, lot four, 13 Crosby Street in the Soho Cast Iron Historic District Extension. This is a Renaissance revival style store and loft building designed by Charles Abbott French and built in 1901, and the application is to enlarge a rooftop bulkhead and extend the chimney. Good afternoon, commissioners. It's nice to see you in person. <laughs> um, I'm Sarah Ripple with Higgins Quays Barth and Partners. We're the preservation consultants on this project. Uh, our design team not present today is Canon Architecture. As Corey mentioned, this is 13 Crosby, a Renaissance revival style store and loft building. Um, designed by Charles Abbott French, built circa 1901, located in the Soho Extension, which was designated in 2010. It's located on Crosby between Howard and Grant. It's currently undergoing some work right now to accommodate a new tenant square cash app who will take floors one through six, so that's the whole building, except for the cellar, which has a, uh, a separate tenant. Uh, this is a proposal to provide access to the roof by extending the existing freight elevator shaft. The adjacent chimney flue is still in operation, so as required, that will also be extended an additional three feet above the bulkhead. It is primarily visible over the south facade, as you see here, due to a break in the street wall. The parged masonry facade and that finish will be maintained at the extension and at the chimney to create a mutual presence in both materiality and typology as a typical rooftop accretion. So the uh, existing conditions at the roof, in the top left photo, you see the existing freight bulkhead and chimney, <coughs> along with various rooftop mechanical. It is this freight bulkhead that will be extended, situated to the south of the existing rooftop deck, which you see in that top right image, which is built up on steel dunnage. And to the right of the deck, you see the existing stair and passenger elevator bulkheads at the north. Um, the bottom two photos are detail views showing the proximity of the freight elevator to the deck, the parapet, and the tall cornice beyond. So within the surrounding block, we see this roof line in the ahistorical context of the break in the street wall and contemporary high rise behind it, as well as in relationship with the visible historic bulkheads to the south and across the street and with visible contemporary bulkheads over the primary facades of 27 and 29 Howard at the south that you see kind of in the distance in that middle photo, um, all part of the uh, historic district extension. So we see, uh, we find this proposal in keeping with the character of the district roofscape, which is defined by a variability at the roof line with utilitarian simply designed rooftop elements visible over both primary and secondary facades like the water towers, brick bulkheads, chimneys and flues, projecting parapets as seen in the street views along West Broadway and Broadway in the bottom photos. And the store and loft building type, uh, as you see in the top three photos, uh, those in particular feature visible elevator bulkheads due to placement near the primary facade. Uh, <laughs> Okay, excellent. <laughs> um, in elevation, we see the bulkhead in relationship to the other existing elements of the roof. 
The bulkhead will be extended 15 feet. And as mentioned, the chimney is another three feet above the bulkhead. Uh, here in the roof plan, we see the other elements at the roof and their placement in relationship to the freight elevator, which is at the top of the, uh, the top of the plan. The south side of the roof accommodates a fair amount of mechanical dunnage, plumbing, and other accretions. Uh, an existing rooftop deck on steel dunnage is at that center. Uh, and the north side has the machine room, existing passenger elevator, stair bulkhead, and additional mechanical. Currently, neither of these elevators provides access to the roof. It's only accessible by stair. Uh, so the eight and a half by seven foot bulkhead footprint will be maintained. We have the existing on the left and proposed on the right. Uh, and as you see that the existing parapet to the south of the bulkhead will remain at its current height. Uh, this east-west section shows the roof slope from Crosby Street towards Lafayette. We're schematically showing the massing of the bulkhead and the chimney. The sill of the elevator doors is elevated to clear the existing plumbing. Um, the existing elevator bulkhead is 7 foot 11 inches tall and the proposed is 22 11 inches. Uh, breaking down the interior of that, uh, of that bulkhead, we see the 9 foot cab, 5 foot required clearance space, and the 6 foot mechanical space above that. The chimney to be extended 3 feet again, and uh, the relationship to the existing stair bulkhead and machine room to the north side of the roof is, is also apparent here. Um, so this section uh, cut through the parapet uh, shows how that parapet height will be maintained, providing a distinction between the existing and, um, and the proposed. Uh, and also in setting back the face of the bulkhead, uh, the massing is visually broken down from the street perspective. So we'll look through some of the visibility studies. Um, as you see in the lower right-hand corner, we have our key plan map. Um, and a shaded triangle that shows the primary locations of visibil visibility down here in red. It's a um, you know, portion of the, the block along Crosby, um, starting from the south at Howard and moving up until you, you hit our building. So that, that's the primary and limited uh, visibility uh, locations. Uh, so as mentioned, the chimney and bulkhead will be parged masonry to match the secondary elevation. We have our existing on left and the proposed rendered on right. Um, it'll match the secondary elevation to create a neutral presence at the roof. And you can see the break between the existing parapet and the bulkhead. Again, breaking down that massing and providing some differentiation. This southernmost view is the greatest point of visibility and it's just a moment. Um, as you move northward towards the building, the bulkhead then becomes visible within the context of that high rise and the gap in the street wall. As soon as you step in front of the building and move northward, the visibility disappears. The work is non-visible. And as you move further down the street at the corner and then farther down along the next block, it remains uh, invisible. A small portion becomes visible at a greater distance, about two blocks away when it becomes disassociated and simply part of the skyline. Um, so based on this limited vantage of visibility, the simple materiality, in character as a typical rooftop accretion, we find it in keeping with the roofscape throughout the district. Um, with that, thank you. I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Do we have any questions? Okay, we'll move to public testimony then. Simeon Bankoff. Good afternoon, Commissioner Simeon Bancon, Historic Districts Council. I'm actually going to be departing from uh, your testimony because something came up in the presentation that makes uh, it raises questions. Originally, um, we had understood that this elevator bulkhead was needing to be extended for accessibility purposes um, because of a you know ADA requirements that you have accessibility and that they're going to be obviously using the roof. However, in the presentation, it seems that this, uh, this is already served by a passenger elevator and that this is a rooftop, this is a, just the freight. Is that correct? Okay, if, if indeed that is, is uh, not correct. Um, we understand the intent of the application was to satisfy accessibility requirements, but wonder if the proportions of the proposal were absolutely necessary. These enlargements are extremely visible and are three times the size of what is currently now there. 
uh, we asked the applicants to restate the issue and modify the scale of the enlargement to the least intrusive height possible. And I, I would appreciate if in the conversation some discussion of accessibility and code. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who'd like to speak? Okay. All right, and we'll note for uh, the record that Community Board, Manhattan Community Board 2 recommended denial of the application. Would you like to respond to the comments? Yes, thank you, Sarah. Um, <laughs> yes, so accessibility to the roof, accessible access to the existing roof deck is part of the, uh, part of the effort here. Um, it is also uh, wrapped into the desire to upgrade an outdated freight system. Um, and as I mentioned, neither of the two elevators currently access the roof. It's only accessible by stair. Um, so in, in taking into consideration the, the variables at play here, um, utilizing the existing freight elevator uh, shaft and um, it, it's kind of, uh, you know, checking off multiple boxes here um, by providing that uh, accessibility as well as freight capacity throughout the building. Um, and upgrading an, an outdated system. But it seems like the, 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 the override space is very large um, and that hence your diagrams. Um, is that because you could not fit a more contemporary style with the, without the whole hoistway stuff being right on top? Uh, so <laughs> bear with me as the preservation consultant, it probably doesn't come as a surprise that I'm not the, the elevator expert here, but in lieu of our architect, um, uh, it is, it's my understanding from their feedback that this is the, the minimum space required for, um, for a traction elevator, that um, the five feet of clearance for uh, access for repairs, and then the six feet of mechanical above that. And I think that choice to do the traction is because it's an existing shaft if that's getting to what you were asking right yes thank you thanks yes Anne. did you look excuse me did you look at the option of using the other elevator to bring that one up to the roof we did we discussed this um the the team assessed the possibility of using the existing passenger elevator, um, but found multiple positives um, to using the freight. As I mentioned, that the freight is outdated and would need to be updated anyway, the structure around it being updated as part of the interior um, floor repair, floor plate repair. Um, and uh, in upgrading the freight will also allow for carrying mechanical, whatnot up to the roof. Um, and allowing accessible access, as we mentioned, to the existing roof deck without penetrating the, uh, without interrupting the FDNY clear access path. Um, so the, the FDNY access path is on the north side where we have that clear space between the uh, existing stair bulkhead um, and uh, using the, the existing passenger elevator would, would disrupt that, that pathway. Um, and then of course we considered it from the, uh, the view of added potential visibility. And uh, we considered that you'd have the same height and the same level of visibility, whether you do it at the south side or at the north side. Um, and at least from the south side, we find or we feel that it's, it's a better context to see this within because it's, as mentioned in a historical context, it's a large break in the street wall and there's a contemporary, um, contemporary high rise directly behind it. That, that's the, that's the view that you get, whereas from the north side, you would be seeing it within context of historical buildings. Um, we, we found it to be more appropriate to locate it on the south side. And on the north side, I think you would, would you see it for a greater distance? It seems like it would be an open-ended. Yes, uh, we did not study that, but um, considering the, the views that, you, that we did have, um, it's safe to assume. Okay. So, uh, are you saying that the overdrive on the passenger elevator and the overdrive on the freight elevator are the same and they would be the same height? That's my understanding. Yes. Because it, it all depends on the type of you know, traction, you know, different. Right. That's right. I so, this is, this is quite high. This overdrive is quite, I mean, I have never seen one done. Right. I mean, it, it is. It is visible, but it's an entirely visible south elevation. And that's um, the existing elevator that was there 
at the beginning of the project, but this is new. I'm sorry, what can you repeat that? The, and the freight elevator. Yes. That's an existing freight elevator. Yes. 25 right. years, 30 years old, or something like that. I'm sorry, I didn't catch the, that. The elevator, the image of the elevator. Oh, That's yes. there now. It's been there for quite a while. Like, it's yes. not a new elevator. You're not getting no. a new one. That, no. That's correct. The The freight elevator is, is older. It's outdated. Um, whereas the passenger elevator has been more recently upgraded. Um, that was also a consideration in, in this, that work has been done more recently on the passenger elevator. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Any final questions? All right, let's uh, move to close the hearing. Commissioner Goldblum, would you make a motion to close the hearing? So moved. And uh, Commissioner Bland, would you second that motion? Second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, so the hearing is closed and we're gonna begin our discussion. So um, the applicant has explained um, the proposal to use an existing shaft and why they chose this one um, and the restrictions on the roof. Um, and in the views, this is um, a, a fairly open side wall, but it is a somewhat limited view corridor. And, and, um, and that's another reason for choosing this side. Um, they're also bringing up the chimney as well, which is the piece that extends a little above the uh, bulkhead and cladding it all in a, a material that matches the side wall. So uh, Commissioner Chen, would you like to start this one? Yeah, I walk by here quite frequently because uh, my morning exercise to uh, walk from Spring Street down, like a commissioner Glenn would do. Uh, so, um, so your observation is correct. If coming from the north, walking uh, towards south, uh, if you were to put it on the north side of the building, it would be much more visible. Uh, so it's a less of the two evils. Uh, so given that this existing bulkhead, uh, I can uh, I can deem it appropriate. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Brown. I agree. Um, um, as the applicant pointed out, there's there's a streetscape, uh, skyscape scape of rooftop additions, visible rooftop additions here, and I think um, being a um, service focused as opposed to a, um, an occupiable space up there, it it uh, doesn't, to my mind, uh, catch my eye in any unfortunate way. And I think this is the right side as opposed to the other side to put it on. So I can accept this. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Jefferson. I have a little bit of a difficulty with this one because the, from this view, it's obviously a, a new addition that's quite high. And I'm not sure that the technical issues can't be resolved another way. So I'm, I'm, I'm somewhat, on the fence on this one. Okay. I think providing the rooftop access is something that more people are gonna to wanna to do uh, going forward. So I think it's appropriate to do that. And I agree that this location is the more appropriate location on the building, even though it is visible. So I can find it appropriate. Okay. Commissioner Chapin. Yeah, these, it's unfortunate these things have to be such a monster size and it's distressing, but I mean, they've done the best they could with really trying to put it in the right location and, you know, sort of camouflage it a bit. Uh, so, you know, I guess I can thank, I okay. will go for it. Commissioner Copeland. I agree, it's appropriate. Okay. And I do as well. I think this is actually a district where we do see a lot of visible bulkheads as was shown in the presentation. Okay, so Commissioner Chen, would you make the motion? In the matter LPC 21-10606, 13 Crosby Street, Soho Cass Island Historic District Extension. Uh, the application is to enlarge a rooftop bulkhead and extend a chimney. I recommend approval finding that the proposed work will not damage or eliminate any significant architectural features, that the proposed rooftop elevator bulkhead, which will place an enlarged the existing bulkhead in the same location will be set back from the front and rear facades and will not be visible over the primary facade of the building, that the elevator bulkhead and chimney will be visible only over the secondary south facade along Crosby Street and their presence will be in keeping with the visible 
rooftop structures found along this street and throughout this historic district. That the bulkhead and chimney will be extended to the minimum height required to meet safety regulations. That the proposed masonry construction and stucco cladding will be of the same material and finished color uh, as the existing uh, bulkhead and side facade of the building, helping the addition to blend with its surroundings. That the proposed work will not detract from the special architectural historic character of the Soho uh, Cast Iron Historic District Extension. Thank you. And Commissioner Brand, would you second that motion? Second. All right, John. Chair Carroll. Aye. Commissioner Bland. Aye. Commissioner Chapin. Aye. Commissioner Chen. Aye. Commissioner Goldblum. Aye. Commissioner Holford Smith. Aye. Commissioner Jefferson. Yes. Aye. Uh, six in favor, one opposed. Okay, so that's approved. Thank you. Thank you so much. We'll go to the next item. Okay, we're now going to move to item number seven, LPC 22-00009, an application for a certificate of appropriateness in the borough of Manhattan, block 1066, lot 32, 400 West 57th Street, the Windermere Individual Landmark. This is an eclectic style apartment complex designed by Thea Phyllis G. Smith and built in 1880 to 81. And the application is to construct rooftop and rear yard additions and solve rooftop mechanical equipment alter the areaways and install a barrier of reaccess lift. Good afternoon, commissioners. Uh, it's nice to be here. Um, my name is Valerie Campbell. I'm a partner at Kramer Levin. I'm here with Nick Chelko, an architect with Morris Ashman Architects. The window mirror will be familiar to many of the commissioners here because it does have a long history. It's an individual landmark located at 400 West 57th Street. It was constructed in the early 1800s and designed by Theophilus uh, G. Smith. It was one of the first residential projects in New York City that catered to bachelor women. Unfortunately, under prior ownership, the building was allowed to deteriorate. Tenants were subject to decades of harassment and the, big, the building became uninhabitable. It was landmarked in 2005. An order to vacate was issued in 2007 and the building was the subject of extensive litigation relating to the tenant harassment and the failure to maintain the building. <clears throat> Ultimately, the former owner was ordered to repair the building and substantial fines were imposed. The current owner acquired title in 2009 and entered into a stipulation with the city to undertake the required repairs and provide the affordable housing. Because of the extent of the required structural work and the proposed commercial use, the building cannot retain its former legal non-compliance with zoning and requires a special permit pursuant to section 74711. The building is proposed to be enlarged with an expansion of the existing eighth floor and the construction of a ninth, ninth story penthouse. As reconstructed, it would have a residential portion providing approximately 20 units of permanently affordable housing for seniors with a dedicated circulation system and the remainder of the building would be used for either transient hotel or commercial office use. The adaptive reuse requires a number of zoning waivers, including waivers to permit the commercial use above the second floor, as well as heightened setback, minimum distance between buildings and court waivers. In connection with the special permit, the owner would do restorative work and enter into a continuing maintenance program. The commission originally approved this project with modifications in 2014 and a design approval certificate of appropriateness was issued in 2017. In the interim, the owner commenced the structural and restorative work and the special permit application process. The special permit application was certified in April of this year and the project is currently in ULERB. Community Board 4 and the Borough President uh, have issued favorable recommendations for the special permit application and the city planning vote is expected in late August. Um, however, the design approval C of A lapsed in November of 2019 and the storefront work that was included in that original C of A 
uh, was the subject of a subsequent C of A. This new application is for the previously approved rooftop addition and area way work. However, as Nick will describe, the current application does reflect some changes to the associated bulkheads that result in additional visibility in order to conform with code requirements and in order to provide the affordable housing senior residents with access to a dedicated outdoor space on the roof. And now Nick will go through the uh, proposed work. Great, thank you, Valerie, and good to be with you all in person. Uh, so yes, yeah, some of the work has been done uh, that, that we all looked at in 2014 and again in 2017. And, and just to recap on, on some of that, because some of that work, because we're all proud of it. Uh, you can see the image, the current photo on the bottom right, um, which is, was the, that's the building as it is today uh, with, with, you know, the facade, uh, exterior wall restoration of the, of the, the masonry facade of West 57th. Ninth Avenue, but also around the building to its second neighbor facades, court, um, courtyards, all that's been repointed, uh, structurally stabilized. So the, the wood joists have been replaced with steel, uh, windows have replaced, the cornices replaced, non-historic fire escapes removed, and uh, the portico and storefront reconstruction is uh, in progress, as you can see. So today, what we're focused on is really the rooftop addition and the areaway along the sidewalk. So uh, this is largely what you saw earlier, the, the, especially for the, the areaway, there's really no change to the proposal. Um, and with the rooftop addition, there's minor changes that, that we'll show you that's related to, um, to the elevator bulkheads. But just to start with the airway, again, no change here, but to review what, what we're proposing, uh, it's, uh, it, it, this is separate from the portico work itself, but related um, in that the, the low stone wall that you see in the historic uh, photo on the bottom left, that will be a, a part of what will constitute the areaway. Um, and it will be topped for pedestrian safety with a proposed um, ornamental painted railing. And this system will also have um, the, accessible left, the accessible lift that you see here on the right but it's probably best seen here in section. So the gate is gonna function as the accessible entrance to the building um, with the, the lift paired with the stair and hosted at the bottom of the stair. It will have a call box at the top um, and the stair treads and nosing is all cast stone to uh, match the portico stoops. So the rooftop addition, um, there's, there's two programs to this building. Is 20 affordable residential units, uh, and the remainder is commercial. And each one has its own uh, circulatory system, if you will. So stairs and elevators. Um, HPD has requested that the residential residential users have rooftop access. So we're accommodating that, and um, we're doing that. That that is a elevator bulkhead that you see from West 57th Street. And then the commercial users would also have rooftop access uh, to the program space on the roof. And that's the bulkhead really page left um, that is over 9th Avenue. So we'll be talking about these two bulkheads as they really are the elements that constitute visibility. And here's the plan. So now north is page up. West 57th Street is up. So you see the residential uh, bulkhead or elevator and stair going to the roof. And on the bottom of the page, you see the commercial uh, elevator and stair. So we, we worked from 2014 to 2017, we worked to really remove um, the visibility of the, the ninth floor addition portion um, by setting back 25, roughly 25 feet from all facades. Um, and so it's really the bulkheads, again, that, that constitute visibility. You see here the roof plan. We remove the mechanical equipment um, from the eighth story and put that over the ninth story. Um, again, to remove visibility of that element. So here, here you can see the difference between the 2017 proposal and today. 
Um, the 2017 is indicated in a dashed pink line. So really is to accommodate a stretcher capacity elevator. Um, on, on the top, you can see the, again, this, this elevation is, is 25 feet back from the historic uh, parapet, but uh, you can see the residential bulkhead on the right is 22 inches closer to the uh, lot line. So it got a little bit wider. That elevator also moved two inches closer to the street. On the left, you see the commercial bulkhead, which moved three inches closer to the street and six inches closer to the lot line. But the materiality is the same as was originally proposed, which is corrugated gray metal. And to get into view, uh, view analysis, the last portion here. So we just wanted to start with sort of the classic view on the corner. There's no visibility here. Uh, I think it's good just to establish where, where there's no visibility. And then moving away, we're gonna go, we're gonna go up Ninth Avenue, moving north. You can start to see visibility. There's a so as part of the, the work that's been done, um, there's temporary enclosures for weatherproofing the building, and you can see that in the existing photo. Um, that's not actually the volume of the bulkhead, but it's a good reference point. And the rendered is on the right. As we move a little bit further up Ninth Avenue, you can see it. And at that point, it starts to go past the, uh, the corners of the building across the street. Now we're on West 57th Street. A little bit closer, this is where you're seeing the commercial bulkhead over the Ninth Avenue facade. And we move a little bit further away. And again, that's just before it, it starts to disappear behind the context. We go south on Ninth Avenue. And is where you see the rooftop addition and the, the commercial bulkheads over the secondary facade. And if we go west on West 57th Street, there's no visibility. Thank you. Thank you. And if you just go back to the, um, I think the second, uh, wait, no, 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 go, uh, go to the second view, the second photo. Screen. Yeah, that one, or even the next one. The 22 inches that it had to get wider, mm -hmm. does that go, sorry, I missed it. Does it go to the west or does it go to the north? Yeah, that goes to the west. The west. It goes two inches to the north, closer to the to primary the north. facade. So it's two inches closer to the north than it was and 22 inches wider. Yeah. Okay. Right. And that is for new code requirements, right? Yeah, for stretcher capacity. For stretchers, okay. Other questions? No, help me out. Where is the affordable housing? I'm sorry? Where is the yeah. plan for affordable housing? So the affordable housing is, is represented by, I would say the, the, the four windows on the far right of your screen for seven floors. And that goes through the building back um, toward the rear. So there's street facing apartments and rear facing apartments. Okay, thank you. And they'll have their own separate entrance. And again, they have their own separate elevator, stairs, um, and it's separate from the commercial user. There's no other residential users in the building. Thank you. All right, other questions? Okay, we'll take testimony and, and we'll come back to you. All right, Christabel Goff. Oh, no, sorry, that's for the next one. Okay, nobody has signed up for this item and just want to confirm nobody would like to speak on this item. Okay. All right. And I'll just note for the record that Manhattan Community Board 4 um, wrote a letter um, to, let me just actually pull it up here. wrote a, a letter in uh, reaffirming support for the 74711 and, um, and uh, reaffirming support for the, uh, of the C of A and the 74711 application and question the rooftop addition and the uh, consideration of wheelchair accessibility along 57th Street. 
So I, I, I don't know if you want to address that, if that came up in your recent meeting with them. You're welcome to go ahead and do that. You didn't talk about that? No, we, we could talk about that. Yes, you, please do. Yeah. That's the only testimony we have. So feel free to go ahead and respond. I'm gonna sure, and the two pieces, I'm sorry, the two pieces of that was the accessibility yeah. on West 57th Street, is that right? I wanna just read it exactly the way they wrote sure. it, which is not on, on this page of paper. So let me just get that. All right, long supported the renovation of this building and the need to resolve the long history of harassment that occurred at this site. Um, however, we ask that more thought be given to the issues of wheelchair access along 57th Street and whether the rooftop addition is appropriate. Right. Uh, so in, in, in terms of our dialogue with the community, um, there was a view that the the accessibility on West 57th Street as proposed felt like a second class entrance um, as as the user would descend down the stairs through a lift and enter at the cellar level, picking up the elevator then through the rest of the building. So the, the question on the table was, can you get them up to the, the, the ground floor lobby? In this building, of course, the ground floor is five feet above the street, so that presents some challenges. Um, Challenges in which I think really at this point, the, the ULERP schedule can't accommodate, but I do believe it's the intent um, to revisit those as a design discussion. Um, we just re revisit that item. And in terms of the rooftop addition, um, there's, there's been much discussion, I think even, with, and we feel at this point, it's, it's, at, it's, um, it's pushed back as far as it can be to be programmable space. Um, and then of course the, the inclusion of the residential users to the roof, um, which again was a request of, of the HPD that, that we'd like to accommodate. Um, that's where you're seeing this view um, of, the, of the elevator bulkhead there. And that's, that's the additional visibility there. Okay, thank you. All right, if there are no other questions, we'll have a motion to close the hearing. Commissioner Jefferson, would you make a motion to close the hearing? Commissioner Hoffman. Thank you. I heard you. Second. All right. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Hearing is closed and we'll begin our discussion. So as was presented, this is basically a, a renewal of a CFA that we issued in the past where some of the much of the work has been completed and happily all of the restoration work has been completed. So that's wonderful and, and we're very proud of it also. Um, and then uh, the two, two remaining pieces to be completed are the areaway entrance and lift and the um, rooftop addition, which um, was previously approved, but there are some changes to the bulkheads, which we just reviewed where they get wider for uh, code reasons. So Commissioner Bland, would you like to start this one? This is perfectly acceptable. Um, minimally different from what we've approved in the past and uh, um, still slightly minimally, I would say visible uh, rooftop addition, but it's, it's fine with me. Commissioner Jefferson. I think it's appropriate. I think the, um, the elevator bucket minimally visible and I think the, the landing and the start area is fine. Commissioner Halpern Smith. I think it's all appropriate. Commissioner Chapin. Yes, uh, I agree that it's uh, it, the changes are minimal from the previously approved in terms of perception. So I can approve this. Okay, and Commissioner Copeland. No disagreement. It's an important, wonderful building, and anything we can do to get the hell out of the way and get it occupied would be great. Great, agree. Totally agree. It's about time. Great, thank you. Okay, so I think we have a consensus to approve. Commissioner Bland, will you read the motion? Oh. <clears throat> in a matter of 400 uh, West 57th Street, the window made an individual landmark. Um, let's see, this is an application to construct rooftop and rear yard additions, install rooftop mechanical equipment, alter the areaways, and install a barrier free access lift. Uh, <clears throat> I note that. 
Uh, most of the work was previously approved under the Certificate of Appropriateness 19-12919, but the permit has since expired. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, I recommend approval, noting that the changes to accommodate the adaptive use uh, of these adjoined historic apartment houses, including combining the buildings internally and expanding uh, upward with an overlapping roof top addition and bulkheads to accommodate new residential and hotel uses will be consistent with the appearance of the original buildings as an as an architectural unified complex. That the rooftop addition will be set back from the front and side facades, thereby helping to maintain a sense of the building's historic massing. That the rooftop additions will be visible from the public thoroughfare over 9th Avenue and West 57th Street facades only at a distance and from limited vantage points and will have a simple appearance that does not compete with the ornate facades of the building. That the rooftop additions will be visible over the south side uh, facade but will be partially screened by raising a portion of the masonry parapet and will be set back far enough so that it will neither overwhelm nor detract from the Ninth uh, Avenue facade from vantage points to the south. That the proposed penthouse addition, bulkheads, and mechanical enclosure closures will be clad in gray corrugated metal in keeping with the historic material uh, palette of the building, including its cornice and other metalwork. And other and will otherwise be consistent with materials commonly used at utilitarian rooftop accretions. But the demolition of the secondary facades at the non visible interior courtyards and the reconstruction of these facades in a new configuration uh, consisting of a central courtyard at grade and inner uh, corner courtyard above a one-story full lot extension will not result in any damage to or destruction of any significant architectural features of the building. And that the installation of a new gate and landing, descending stairs, and barrier-free access chairlift behind the restored airway wall west of the storefront return uh, along the West 57th Street facade will not result in any damage to it significant architectural features uh, to any of the um, significant architectural features of the building and the location between the prominent portico stoops and below grade will help minimize their presence. Okay. And Commissioner Jefferson, would you second that motion? Second. And John, will you call the vote? Sure, Carol. Aye. Commissioner Bland. Aye. Commissioner Chapin. Aye. Commissioner Chen. Aye. Commissioner Goldblum. Aye. Commissioner Holford Smith. Aye. And Commissioner Jefferson. Aye. Seven in favor, none opposed. The motion carries. Thank you. Good luck. Okay, we're now going to move to item number eight. LPC 21-06662, an application for a certificate of appropriateness in the borough of Manhattan, Block 1286, Lot 21, 451 through 455 Madison Avenue, aka 29 and a half East 50th Street, the Henry Villard houses in part. This is an individual landmark. It's a complex of Italian Renaissance style townhouses designed by McKim, Mead, and White and built in 1882 to 85. And the application is to establish a restoration master plan for the use of substitute materials. Hi everyone, I'm Rebecca Riley. I'm from EDG and we'll be presenting regarding 455 Madison. As just noted, the property is located along Madison Avenue between 50th and 53rd Street. We were able to obtain a few historic photos from the Library of Congress. Um, as you can see, this one's before there was later on additions in the 1970s. Again, some older photos of the courtyard area along Madison Avenue. 
and some perspectives at the corners along Madison Avenue as well. Um, this portion of the building on the left side was later demolished, as well as the right side portion on the south side. Um, this is an overview prior to the tower addition, and you can see that the tower, um, the small tower part on the south side was later demolished. We have some 1940s um, tax photos. So as stated, the building was originally constructed in 1882, designed by McKim Meaden White, and it was established as a private residence in the 1970s. It was converted into a hotel. A portion of the building was demolished and the tower was built in its place. Um, the tower was designed by Emory Roth and Sons. Um, when the building portion was demolished, it became an MOU status. Um, part of that declaration included salvaging the stone that was removed during the demolition phase, but we do not have records of it. Um, we've gone back as far as 2001. The hotel has changed plan, um, hands a few times, and the storage that they've had since 2001 does not have any of the pieces, unfortunately. So in general, from what we've been able to see in recent years, there haven't been major replacements done. Um, in general, it seems like there's a lot of patching, a lot of which is starting to fail. Um, so these are from the chimneys along the west side, Madison Avenue, and a lot of the stone has started to fall. Again, this is along the courtyard, courtyard side, um, typical spalling delamination. Similar conditions on the south side of the courtyard. We also have some cracking happening along the south elevation on the lintel pieces all of which we intend to replace. Again, some spalling. And in this location, it seems as though it was patched previously and started to fail. And we just have a typical crack. Um, over the winter, we did, sorry. Over the winter, we did perform an inspection and remove loose pieces of stone. They also have a sidewalk shed installed along the street facing elevation. And some typical areas, some of that was patched previously. We also have these decorative elements at the corners level, which the owner intends to restore to original condition. Um, so we've called out specific areas of um, replacement pieces, and we're also going to be mobilizing the entire facade to evaluate further as we go along. Some typical locations of replacements. Similar issues on the north side and the south side. Um, one of the difficulties that we've had is that the original brownstone supplier is no longer acquiring. So we've reached out to a lot of stone suppliers in the area. Obviously, this sample that we were able to obtain is not a suitable match. We we're also able to obtain this sample, which was getting procured from China. Um, this sample wasn't a very close match. We do have it in person today if you'd like to look at it. Um, and it also became an issue of us getting the work done and procuring the material. We were also able to get this additional set of stone samples, um, which are also here. They're labeled from Ohio um, and the LPC has approved it. The reason- The building itself here? What? Do you have any, like, what, what are you comparing these to? The, you, don't have, you don't have a sample here of the building. No, I don't. Um, so, I believe it is Portland Brownstone. Um, our concern in general is that we might not be able to have enough stone from the quarry. We're trying to confirm 
but we are proposing Castone as a master plan so that we can have consistent restoration in the future. Um, again, we're concerned that we're gonna have the same issue down the line where we get this quarry approved from Ohio and they may not have enough stone available or they'll close. So that's all I have. Okay, Thank and you. so the stone from Ohio is the one that the staff has seen in the field against the building and uh, yes. has approved it. That's correct. Okay, and um, is there and is it your sense that there's enough at the quarry for these this first round of emergency repairs that need to be made? We're still going back and forth with the supplier on that. It sounds like there's a substantial amount left. It's just not 100% clear to us, honestly. Right. And I think it also, yeah, OK. We also haven't ordered it yet. So I guess, in theory, someone could be ahead of me and order the stone and, I don't know, they run out. OK, thank you. Other questions? Yes. Have you checked with Pez Valco? They do a lot of stone salvage. They're in New Jersey. I think we, we did try to reach out to them, because I think X-Tech bought Pez Valco. And they um, weren't having stuff available for us. I think they bought them like maybe a few years ago. Other questions? Yes, Commissioner Jefferson. Just one question. This, this brownstone is about 100 years old, I think, existing. Mm -hmm. The cast stone, how long did it last? Do you know when you cast it? Do we have a lifetime of cast stone? That's recent, like 50 years, 30 years. Yeah, I mean, I would say easily 50 years. Yeah, I think that would depend on the anchorage. But it'll, it'll weather differently than the, than the brownstone will. All right, other questions? All right, we have some testimony and we'll come back after the test. Yeah. Oh, sure. Okay. Yeah. What is our opinion on which aspect? Of the well specific to brownstone i think the reality is because it is been so difficult to uh, find sources of good matching stone. Uh, and because the staff level rules for this specific material of brownstone do already allow for cast stone on most buildings, uh, which actually includes individual landmarks. However, this one's a little different in that it has the special permit associated with it as well. That we uh, very rarely, if ever, see applications for, for new sandstone, which is important while you're seeing it today. And so, this particular stone that was, uh, you know, shown to us and looked like a good, pretty good visual match is not one that we're familiar with in terms of understanding how it will perform over time, physically or visually. But uh, under all of the circumstances and sort of preferencing a natural stone, we we decided that we would um, take that into account and, and, and make that approval. Um, you know, cast stone, as was stated, can in itself last a very long time. However, its visual appearance can change much more quickly quickly than its physical characteristics. So that's something else to consider here as well. But unfortunately, we don't have any track record with this stone or, or any other brown but stones. That in my history here, I remember a number of cases, I mean, 99% of the times we see stuff, it's for stucco replacements, right? But there have been cases, mostly on the Upper East Side, if I recall, where people have gone in and done new natural stone, brown colored natural stone facades to emulate brownstone. And they were either the Chinese stuff or they were, I think we did one with terracotta. Uh, I mean, it, have, could, would it be possible or feasible or reasonable to take a look at those? and see how they've weathered to get a sense of whether or not this is a uh, viable option? Yeah, I think most useful would be to locate one that did use another species of, of brownstone or sandstone. The terracotta we've done at least once. We've also done lighter sandstones with a stain on them to make huh. them have the, a better matching color. Huh. 
Um, and those, you know, again, I don't think we have a track record of looking at them 10 years later, but we could do that. Yeah, and there was also a job I remember where we had a brownstone where we made we all made a big fuss over it, and they had like kind of an aggregate spray that they were going to put in it to make it have a little variation. Do you remember that one? There was something like that where it was a very specific kind of precast process. That I don't remember. Michael but... Devonshire, there was something with the variation in the stone and having an aggregate that would kind of mimic the stray, you know, this settling of stone in, in sedimentary rock kind of thing. You know, I think that, um, you know, you, we at the table don't see it all the time, but as Corey said, the rules do allow for cast stone as a replacement for brownstone because there is the issue of um, quarries closed and, and lack of material available. Um, in cases where the entire facade was going to be reconstructed, we have seen them and people have proposed um, a different sandstone material that is slightly different in color from the original, but the whole facade was being replaced. It wasn't being added next to existing stone where you'd see the difference in the color. Um, but of course that would weather in the same way sandstone would and that it would exfoliate whereas cast stone would weather differently. Um, so, and again, the reason this is before us is because of that special uh, 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 agreement under the MOU. In, in terms of the question of whether the quarry might close uh, in this unusual circumstance because the original special permit and C of A required stone to be salvaged and stored for exactly this purpose to be used for repairs in the future and that has not happened one idea has been that uh once the amount of uh, stone that is available now is determined uh enough to be purchased and stored off-site by the applicant so they do have their own in-house supply for future repairs yeah I, I think the other thing that's come up in our discussions is that even if you find a quarry that has sandstone, depending on where it is in the quarry, it can have very different character, physical characteristics or visual characteristics. Let's say. Uh, other issues, as I understand it from you know some of the things, is that you know we really don't know the extent of replacement that may be necessary. So we really need a master plan and analysis of the whole. Uh, to decide, you know, how much is going to be needed and how quickly. So, but right. obviously we've got some situation here that needs to be addressed quickly. So yeah. Maybe the, the areas that are far up, you know, which are not so visible in particular. A more delineated approach. Okay. Well, let's take public testimony and then we can continue the discussion. Yeah. Christabel Goff. Christabel Goff, reading for the Victorian Society. The VSNY Preservation Committee was confused by the presentation materials we reviewed. They left it unclear what proposed replacement material may have been approved previously and what the currently proposed replacement material looks like. If this should be clarified during the hearing, it will be too late for us to modify our testimony. Therefore, we will say as a general recommendation that for individual landmarks or any building of great significance, the placement materials should be in kind. Where matching material isn't available, and this may be true for brownstone, though we don't know whether there are non-local sources that are a good match. Substitute materials are a reasonable alternative. Cast stone imitating brownstone can be successful, but requires careful specifying and manufacturing to ensure consistency, longevity, and ability to weather in such a way that the appearance doesn't change drastically when compared to adjacent natural stone. Similar work at the Gramercy Apartments on Gramercy Park was successfully completed a number of years ago. Thank you. Simeon Bankov. Um, 
Good afternoon, commissioners and Scarborough Districts Council. HTC is concerned about this proposal in, its pro uh, in that its appropriateness lives and dies in the skill of the craftspeople doing the actual work as well as the materials being chosen. This is truly a case of the devil living in the details. A stone replacement and substitution can be seamless or grotesque, and the plans are only that plans. We defer to the press capacity of experts such as yourselves and Commissioner Devonshire on reviewing the specs for those plans to be adequate and on the expertise of the LPC staff to ensure they're implemented correctly. We'd like to take this opportunity, however, to refer to one element of these drawings um, specifically. Specifically, slide nine, where it stated the stone from the de demolished portion of the building was intended to be salvaged, but there are no records of the locations of the stone. We are now in the unfortunate position of having witnessed more proposals to remove historic materials that shall someday be reused that we can easily count. This was proposed for uh, this was this was proposed for the removal of black stone panels at the Weaver House earlier this summer, a proposal which is still under consideration. This is no longer believable and should not be considered as a viable strategy uh, by this commission. Thank you. Is there anyone else who'd like to speak on this item? There. Okay. All right. And um, Manhattan Community Board 5 recommended denial of the application for a cast stone master plan replacement program and urges the commission to approve natural stone. Okay. Would you like to respond to the comments? Um, I think there's one comment regarding previous repair materials. Um, I know that Leanne from LPC had researched that and reached out to previous applicants. And in the recent past, it had solely been patching. Um, no use of either a replacement brownstone or an alternate material. Okay. Um, and so, okay, no uh, other final thoughts on the... Na uh, getting natural stone or the amounts of it. We also did research the uh, uh, possibility of getting a sandstone that we would tint. Um, we are a little concerned about that tint folding up over time. And in that process, we did come up with this stone that seems to be appropriate in color. Okay, thank you. All right, so I think we'll move to our discussion. Um, Commissioner Chen, would you make a motion to close the hearing? So Thank you, Commissioner Bland. Would you second that motion? Second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, so the hearing is closed and we'll begin our discussion. And so, Commissioners, I think the, the first question is um, the whether a, a, a cast stone is an appropriate material for repair. And then the second question is the long term question of the master plan and whether it should be um, approved for a long term plan that may, uh, um, you know, that we, where we may not have control over how much of it is actually being replaced. So Commissioner Holford smith would you start this one? Yeah, I think that given the special permit and the prominence of this building, that cast stone is not really appropriate. Uh, it will not weather the same way as the brownstone. When we did the Cooper Union Foundation building, we were lucky enough that they reopened a portion of the Portland Quarry. So I wonder if any of those blocks are still there because there were, there were some extra blocks. Um, so I can, I can give you the contact person who, the person who had purchased that portion of the quarry. Um, but I think that more research needs to be done. Um, whether the Ohio uh, sandstone was appropriate. There, I think there is also a brownstone from the maritime provinces in Canada. Um, but again, I, and I can give you some sources of people to talk to. Um, I think they need to more fully explore the use of natural stone. And as Diana pointed out, we don't know the extent, it's going to be extensive. Right. Just looking at these photos and they haven't done a full, a full um, you know, investigation of this building. So I think they need to do more research and also understand what the full scope of the replacement and repair is going to be. Okay. I would think that patching might be appropriate, more appropriate to cast stone in some locations. Right. Okay. Thank you, Commissioner Chapin. Uh, well, I think that, you know, the use of the cast stone in general is not, not something I would like to see. Uh, and obviously we have a lot of question about what's, you know, the, well, even if these pieces that we're seeing the natural stone are, 
um, you know, close to the original, which obviously the staff can determine. But uh, when we, we need a master plan and analysis as soon as possible to know what we're really dealing with. But uh, I think that if they've got if sufficient quantity can be found of a natural stone that's you know, the right, the closest possible match that we that they should probably do that with the current uh, situation, the places that have already been identified uh, and hope that sufficient quantities can be, you know, assembled for a, a next stage or perhaps even if it's somewhat different, uh, depending on the locations. Uh, it could be acceptable that they use two, two different quarries if they have to or something. Right. Okay, Commissioner Goldblum. Um, I, pers I personally feel at sea without, without uh, Michael Devonshire's uh, technical input on this. Yeah. Um, but in, in his absence, I, I would say I agree totally with what Anne said, first of all, um, uh, and her, her knowledge of the sources, it sounds uh, invaluable. Um, I think natural stone is the way to go. And I, I guess I don't, I don't understand exactly what a master plan in this case would be. Uh, I think that if we approved a material geologically as opposed to geographically. In other words, if it was brown, if it was sandstone, if it was chemically similar to, to the stuff that's on the building, I don't really care where it's from, uh, as long as, you know, because we can be assured that if it is, you know, this much potash, this much, you know, whatever, you know, the, the chemicals, you know, uh, limestone, you know, if, if it was approximately, if it was within a certain kind of geological uh, bandwidth that we felt was uh, going to weather similarly to the original, I don't think the source is as important. Uh, so if we set the criterion for the material based on the performance outcomes we want, then I don't want to say you can replace this, you can't replace that, because you know, in five years, who knows? And not something not, you know, I could put, I could scaffold the whole building today and I can find every problem today and it's still not gonna be enough because tomorrow something else is gonna pop up. So I, I don't think that it would be appropriate for us to do a master plan in the conventional sense. Rather, I'd say, let's set technical criteria for patching materials. Uh, let's also set um, uh, overage requirements, so, you know, specific overage requirements for materials to be stored off site. And let's have a legal arrangement for the materials to be stored in a location where the, you know, the city has some kind of control or access or a third party guarantee. There must be some way to, to affect uh, a situation where we won't lose the stuff um, in 50 years. Uh, so I, I don't think a master plan is the way to go. Thank you, Commissioner Chen. Very interesting conversation. Uh, and my co I wish Michael Devonshire is here. But given what Anne said, I think, you know, the commission has a, has a choice here. And I don't think we have enough information, which is that we know the natural material do not age well, right? And then that becomes the, uh, in, in what quantity uh, do you want to store it? And versus an alternative material, which is a different look at all. And so, I don't know what the what what the choices. I don't think we have. I mean, at least for me, I don't think I have enough information to make a judgment on this one. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Brand. Um, I, I'm at sea as well. Uh, <laughs> but thanks for those of you who are a little closer to the shore, maybe than I am. Um, I guess if 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 further proof is necessary that. The famous uh, New York City brownstone is was made of really material that probably should never have been used. I guess this is it, and I think we're just going to increasingly deal with the uh, deteriorating 
brownstone issues we already have been for years in some places. Uh, to me, I think this and the problem of uh, so many churches, which are just underutilized, these are twin problems that the commission will be facing far into the future. And when they both combine in one place, like Sadian and the Holy Trinity in Brooklyn Heights, it's a, it's a calamity of unknown proportions. Anyway, that's sort of an aside. Um, uh, I, I just don't feel really adequately um, expert on this problem to give any further um, uh, suggestions than what has already been suggested. They sound reasonable to me. Um, and I just, I think it's, it's really going to be a problem <laughs> over the years, and we're going to just have to figure this out. I do, I think the issue of a master plan that uh, uh, um, Michael uh, Go uh, Goldblum brought up is, is an interesting one, and I'm not sure a master plan, I mean, exactly what and why and how, and it's going to continue to deteriorate, so it's going to be an ongoing problem. So maybe it just has to come back, you have to come back to us. Uh, as needed, and we're going to have to figure out something uh, as needed, I mean, as available with, uh, ex ex with the level of expertise at that time. It's a, it's a real problem here. Yeah. Thank you. Commissioner Jefferson. Um, this, this particular building is one of my favorites, and the reason it is, is the consistency of that stone. I mean, that brownstone is so beautiful. It just consistent. So I go for uh, natural stone. But in terms of the master plan, I mean, pieces of that building are going, are going to deteriorate. So if, if two windows deteriorate or one window, we should plan in, in a way that the whole thing is replaced rather than seeing piecemeal of this, because once we start to see this building in pieces, you know, one window here, one window over there, that really would start to become something else. So that's my concern. So I, I, I can see where you know, nature and life can affect the master plan, but having a master plan that we can guide us, I think is it's, would be a good idea. I mean, can, I, can I respond to that? I, yeah. I think that's a really interesting point. And it, it, it is kind of like I was saying to do something that was kind of a spec on the stone. I think that you need a spec on the the degree of repair based on degree of uh, deterioration, you know, because you don't want to have a whole array of Dutchmans over this building. It would be a disaster. So uh, instead of maybe instead of the master plan, you do a spec that says if the damage is this much or that much, then you can do a Dutchman. If it's more than this much, then you have to replace the length from joint to joint, yeah. you know. So it's more of a spec than a than a. Uh, the, you know that way the, that way they wouldn't have to come back to the to, to us every time there was a, a molding that, that blows or a sill but you'd have a spec and you could rely on that spec uh, uh, yeah okay uh, have to come back uh, to staff for some approval of the samples I assume. that's correct <laughs> yes they would have to do that anyway so uh, a master plan would still require, um, you know, a statement that they'd be conforming to the master plan, whatever that criteria is determined yeah. to be, and we'd review samples. Yeah, so. and just just to add to, I, I think the discussion veered a little bit off from what was counted, which was the request to do this as a master plan that would allow for cast stone, you know, after sort of a sequence of vetting occurred, that preference natural stone. But if ultimately that term you know, was determined to be infeasible, that the applicant wouldn't have to come forward every few years to ask for cast stone every time. It, so the idea of the master plan is kind of take care of that approval going forward. And so if, there, if this were a master plan solely for natural stone, the staff would be able to review and approve that as it is. So I think ultimately for the applicant's purposes, they need to move forward, they have some hazardous conditions. So if, if the message is that you all are uncomfortable with cast stone, then they'll continue to, you know, pursue nat uh, natural stone with the staff at staff level. But if they do want to come back with more information and, and continue to talk with you all about a master plan to think about cast stone, then they could do that as well. Yeah. I think some of, some of us, at least I was thinking more of the, the issue of just making sure there was a regular assessment going on because obviously they're telling us that 
and, and as Michael was suggesting as well, and it's obvious that it, you know, you can do a big assessment now and find out, right. you know, several months later, a year later, you've got a whole new kettle of fish. So the question of, uh, I was thinking of more of, you know, making sure there was a, a good assessment going on a regular basis. You know, yeah, yeah. Was, and with, with I, almost every MOU, we do have a cyclical maintenance inspection built into yeah, yeah. it. And so that would be part of, is that part of this MOU as well? I know it's 50 years old. But, That's correct. Yeah. 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 Okay, good. Thank you. Unless they have to do it for the city, for local law 11. Right. Uh, and if they if they did choose to do natural stone, then that would be staff level approval. That's right. Yeah. Okay. So I think um, where we are today is that um, you know with the information that's been presented to us, I think that um, the commission feels that you should pursue a natural stone option, and you can continue to work with staff on that um, in order to consider a sort of longer term plan with an alternative material, I think that um, what the commission would need to evaluate that is a full kind of scope of the deterioration and, and a full inspection at this time of what's anticipated. And um, uh, sort of that, again, laying out that commitment for the future inspections and um, an understanding of all the sources, the resource sources uh, and resources that you've pursued um, the research that you've done and um, thinking about the sort of the type of extent deterioration and the solutions that might be proposed under that master plan, given the, the type of deterioration and the research that you've done on the different available sources. So we won't take an action today. Um, and I think for your immediate repairs, you'd want to pursue that probably with the Ohio Stone if the staff has already seen those samples. Okay, thank All you. Right. Thank you very much. And we'll move to the next and last item of the day. It's item number nine, LPC 21-04098, an application for a certificate of appropriateness number of Manhattan, block 1396, lot 65, 118 East 62nd Street in the Upper East Side Historic District. This is a row house designed by Robert Mook and built in 1869-70 and altered in the late Prozark style by Carrera and Hastings in 1909. And the application is to replace Areaway Ironwork. Good afternoon, I'm Marina Vassarelli. I live at 118 East 62nd Street, and I'm here today to request to replace my 20-year-old three feet six inches fence um, for a five feet two inches fence plus a four feet um, stone curb. Thank you. Um, on the blue map um, on the left shows that the 118 East 62nd Street is located on East 62nd between Lexington and Park Avenue, which is um, part of the um, Upper East Side um, Historical District. And the pink map is a map from the archives that the block um, originally has a block of row houses of similar sizes and design. And these three pictures were taken recently, which show the property and also the adjacent immediate houses that was next to it. So you can see that um, there are two big buildings with, and there are three houses of the similar size between two big buildings. One is on the left, 
the Yardowish building, which is 120-22 East 62nd Street, and then the other one is in the corner of 555 Park Avenue. And this is also um, a recent photo um, looking east for addresses between 134 and to 120 East 22nd Street. And the tall and low fences within this block, it's very common. And both 134 has um, tall fences of five feet nine inches, and then 124 has tall fences of six four six feet four inches, which I will show um, in the latest slides. And this is a 1940 tax photo map of 118 E62nd Street. It was it's the building in the middle. It was originally, as the gentleman has said, it was originally constructed in 1869. And then the facade was later changed in 1999 into the current late Beaux-Arts style. And there's no alleyway ironwork during that time. And these photos were taken at the time when that block was designated as part of the um, Upper East Side historical district. So, and also this shows that there are three buildings between two um, larger residential apartment complex. And this is the current condition of um, 118 E62nd Street. The area, the current three feet six inches um, fence was approved in and installed in year 2000. And there was no curb. And then in the middle picture, you can show that be, I, it's show that because there was no curb, and over the years, it has been damaged by the um, salt and the dull urine. That's why I'm requesting to have a four inch base to protect the fence, which is quite common in, in the neighborhood. And these are my adjacent neighbor on 116 and 114. They all have um, stone curb. And this is the fence that I'm proposing, that it will be a total of five feet, six inches tall, with, um, which include a four inch stone base curb. And then it's a very simple design because I don't, so it will not distract from the facade of the building. And it will be in the identical area way. Okay, thank you. Okay. Oh, do you have more? Or is... I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, okay. you... I, was, I wasn't sure if you were finished. Or... Oh, okay. I, I... There are some precedent slides. Okay, great. Okay. Okay. I'm, I'm sorry. No, that's okay. Please go ahead. Okay. And then um, in the following slides, I just wanted to show some precedent um, in, within the block um, or in the immediate neighborhood. This is a building that is a diagonally across um, 118, my, my property, and which is also a Beaux-Arts style house. And the older photo on the left shows that they have um, a lower fence, and then subsequently they replace it with the current seven feet, three inches fence. And the same similar style. And this is another um, property located on the same block. And this 134 E62nd Street. They, 
Also, um, back in the old days, they have, uh, back in 1940, they have a lower fence, and then now they have been replaced and get the approval from the commission to, to have, they installed a five feet, nine inches fence. And this is located also um, on the other side of the big residential apartment complex. And, and this one house is next to me. And they, in the, back in 1940s, they have a low fence and then they have received approval to build and install a six feet, four inches fence. And then this one, it's um, also a Bruzat style house. And they, it's, it's the next block, it's located at 11 East 62nd Street. They have tall fences historically, as shown on the black and white photo on the left. And then currently they have a tall fence and the fence must be very tall just by judging from the height of the gentleman standing in front of it. So. <laughs> And that's it. Okay, thank you. Yes, Commissioner Chapman. Yeah, I uh, have a question. Um, and uh, thank you for a very good presentation. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I have to say that well, um, Justine Mian has been extremely helpful. I mean, she she is just an absolute joy to work uh, to work with. Nice. I'm thank very you. thankful for that. Yeah, thank you for it's, saying it's, that. Nice to have an owner be able to present without having to have an architect. Uh, not that I'm against architects, but it's <laughs> nice for this. In any event, um, I, you have, I just wanted to ask, because I thought the fence you have is actually rather attractive that's there. And it looks like there are details on the ironwork on your building that are similar. So I'm wondering if it isn't an original fence and, or at least it's, it's in the style of the existing. And whether you could not just use that fence with a curb under it, it is it the... Well, as I understand it, in the tax photo, there is no fence, and that one was approved by the commission in 2000. Oh, so it's, yeah, it's not really an issue. Okay. Thank you for the clarification. I'm sorry, I was not clear. No, it's fine. It's, that's fine. No, thank Great. you. Thank you. Other questions? No. Okay, let's see. We've got some public testimony. Mara Mariano? Well, Mariali, representing Friends of the Upper East Side Historic Districts. Chair Carroll and Honorable Commissioners, Friends has long been an advocate for a more welcoming streetscape and cannot support the proposed five foot six fence. Late 19th century townhouses, such as 118 East 62nd Street, were designed in such a way that the public sidewalk blended seamlessly with private areaways. High fences, although present in the historic district, are not appropriate for this building style and create a hostile environment to the pedestrian. Additionally, we believe the design of the proposed fence to be ordinary and the absence of detail is incongruent with the Beaux-Arts style of the structure. Nevertheless, we appreciate the proposal to paint the ironwork black. Friends understands the need for a new fence and a curb to prevent deterioration. However, we question the selection of bluestone and believe a more durable material would be more appropriate. We urge the applicant to consider a more detailed and lower fence that is more in scale with the row house and would still provide a sense of separation and security for the homeowner. Thank you. Thank you. Simeon Banco. Thank you, District Council. Um, HTC does not object to the installation of a replacement fence on the site, but we're not entirely certain the details on this one are quite appropriate. We recommend the curb detail be realized to fit within the same plane of its neighbors and align with the stoop in the adjacent property. We further recommend that the, the details on the, the iron 
should be more sensitive to this historic facade. Rather than the historic fence proposed, we recommend that some details from existing Juliet balconies be used as inspiration. It's unclear if they are original to the 1909 facade, but they are in line keeping with its design intent. Finally, the proposed height of five and a half feet seems more reminiscent of a holding pen than an area way. We recommend it be dropped down to a more height that would indicate a barrier or not well enough the house. Thank you. Is there anyone else who'd like to speak on this item? Okay. All right. And um, Manhattan Community Board 8 recommended uh, disapproval of the application. So would you like to respond to some of the comments that particularly, I know you've addressed height a little bit and you're welcome to respond to that again as well, um, but also the question about the design of it. Of course, I mean, I am totally open um, to work with um, the commission in, and whoever that it's needed on the height of the fence and also on the design, okay? And I would appreciate um, any guidance or suggestion, and then I'll be so delighted to work with the staff to, to um, address and resolve all the concerns. Okay, thank you. And just one last question for me. If you go back to the slide that shows the commission approved fences on this block, I think it's the next slide, I think. Um, yeah. I think it's going the other direction. Yeah. Okay, so this is one um, was five foot nine inches with the curb, and you're proposing five foot six. Yes. Uh, okay, one is five foot three, and one is five foot nine. And then there's the other building with the shutters, which appears to be taller than that. Okay, so those are the commission okay. approved this ones. This one is six foot four. Six foot four. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Okay, so. Um, Let's see, Commissioner Hoffman Smith, would you make a motion to close the hearing? So moved. Thank you, Commissioner Jefferson. Would you second that motion? Just a second. Oh, I, oh, I second. Thank you. All in favor, so aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, the hearing is closed, and we're going to begin our discussion now. Um, so, uh, as the applicant has presented, this is a building that while originally built in the 19th century, it was redesigned but in uh, 1919 um, with the current Beaux-Arts style facade. And the applicant is proposing a fence that is taller than can be approved at staff level. So um, as precedents they've shown, other Beaux-Arts style buildings in the district with taller fences and some other brownstones on this block with taller fences that have been approved by this commission. So. With that, and, and she's also presented that this is a varied block with different building types as well, and that her uh, group is flanked by larger apartment buildings, if, if that provides some context. So um, with that, we'll start the discussion. Commissioner Chapin, would you like to start this one? Uh, I, uh, I think that it's fine to replace the fence, I mean, to put a fence there, which is, and to, um, I think the footing, it's fine also to have a footing for it. Um, the bluestone is unusual and probably some other material would be desirable, whatever you know, seems most appropriate. As far as the design of the fence, um, the simple picket is okay. Um, and uh, interested in if, if other commissioners think there should be any enhancement of the design, but. I could approve this as presented, except for the material of the curve. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Goldblum? I agree. I, mean, I think that these high fences are a blight, but uh, they are a contextually established blight. So I can't see a good reason to find it to be inappropriate, uh, much as I would like to. Um, I, we've clearly approved them in the past. Uh, and the only thing I would suggest in addition to what Diana had said is that they look to the grill work that's on the Piano Nobile windows as an inspiration and work with staff to have them harmonize. Okay, great. Commissioner Chen? 
Commissioner Brand? Um, yeah, I'm in agreement. Uh, and what we're supposed to opine on the material of the uh, the curb curb it's proposed is blue stone. stone. Yeah, well, the city's made of blue stone curb, so I think it's appropriate. Okay, Commissioner Jefferson. I think it's appropriate, and I, I it could be fussier, but I think it's fine to make it. Okay, uh, Commissioner Hoffman Smith. I think it's appropriate. I think they can work with staff, as uh, Commissioner Goldblum suggested, to use the um, the window guards um, balconies as an inspiration. Okay. All right, great. So I think we can do an approval of modifications, um, asking the applicant to work with the staff on the design of the fence, looking to the window grills uh, as for inspiration and to study the curb material, to further study the curb material. Oh, Diana, sorry. <laughs> You were nodding, so I thought you were nice. I was nodding. I wasn't sure if you were checking everything or you wanted to just do it, so it's fine. Okay, and the matter of a certificate of appropriateness for Manhattan, LPC 210098, 118 East 62nd Street, Upper East Side Historic District. A row house designed by Robert Lincoln, built in 1869 to 70, and altered in a late to Beaux Arts style like we were in these things in 1909. Application is to replace area, uh, uh, area way, area way, <laughs> item work. I note that the style, scale, materials, and details of the building are among the features that contribute to the special architectural and historic character of the Upper East Side Historic District. I recommend approval with modifications, finding that the proposal will not eliminate any historic ironwork, nor will it damage or obscure any significant architectural features of the building or site. That this building was modified in the early 20th century in the Beaux Arts style, is no longer part of a row of cohesively designed townhouses, and is located between a large apartment building and a projecting stoop. Therefore, a taller fence at this location will not detract from the building or the adjacent buildings. But the installation of an area way fence of this height will be consistent with tall fencing at other Beaux Arts style buildings in the district. But the proposed fence was simply designed and consistent with the ironwork found throughout the block and the historic district in terms of materials, the details, and finish. But installing a stone curb will aid in long term protection of the firework and is consistent with stone curbing found at existing area way fences and that the proposed work will not diminish the special architectural and historic character of the building streetscape or historic district. However, I find that the use of bluestone as a curb at area weight fences is atypical in this historic district, and that uh, staff should work with the applicant uh, to re restudy uh, the material of the curb, and also uh, work with the applicant to uh, develop a design for the fence that has some reflection of the um, design in the piano and Opelai. And Commissioner Goldblum, would you second that motion? Second. John, will you call the vote? Chair Carroll? Aye. Mr. Bland? Aye. Mr. Chapin? Uh, aye. Commissioner <laughs> Chen? Aye. Commissioner Goldblum? Aye. Commissioner Holford Smith? Aye. Commissioner Jefferson? Aye. Seven in favor, none opposed. Motion carries. All right, thank you. So that's approved with the modifications on the design and um, the curb material, and the staff will continue to work with you on those details. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks a lot. All right, thank you very much. And that concludes our day today. So thank you to our public who came out today. And thank you, commissioners, for your dedication.